Good morning. How are you? Let me grab my Bible. I am, uh, I'm not the most formal person. Um, I'm a pastor, and I have a church here in Washington, so I got out here. I'm from New Kensington originally. I moved out here about, uh, about five years ago, but before I moved out here, I commuted for about four years, so Washington has quickly become home, and as I was on my, as I'd commute out here, people would go, oh, you're going to Little Washington. I'm like, Little Washington's actually pretty big, so... Um, uh, but it has quickly become home, and as, as, uh, as Becky's already said, I'm the Washington Director for Youth for Christ, and I love what I do. I'm very passionate about the gospel and passionate about people hearing the Word of God in truth and love, in truth and love. And so as we share this morning, uh, I pray that you, you feel that. I pray that God continues to fan the flame of passion in your life for Him. For him. So uh, before I get to the message, I got to put a uh, Youth for Christ dig out there. So um, I do have campus life on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Tuesdays, middle school night. Thursdays are high school night. Uh, if anybody in your high school, I don't dress like this on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I only did that because I'm here at church. <laughs> um, on, uh, uh, on November 1st as well, I am doing a meeting at, uh, what's that place called the, the, that has a really good milk? Um, Springhouse, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm still learning names. Springhouse, I'm doing a, I'm doing a meeting. Well, uh, at Springhouse, and it is uh, just to inform people what is going on. So if you're interested in that, I also have flyers for that. So, but uh, without further ado, we're going to jump into the message. So God, we come before you today, and we thank you for your presence. I thank you for a man named Jesus that has made relationship with Father God possible. So I pray today that as we wrestle with your word as we jostle with it, God, that you would speak words of love and affirmation. I pray today that you would flood people's hearts with light, that they're able to see Jesus in all situations. Uh, Father, I pray today that we walk out with a different perspective of who we, who we thought you were to who we know you are. Reveal yourself to us today. Spirit of the living God, I pray that you would season my words because the, the word of God tells us that the word kills, but the spirit quickens and makes it alive. God, apart from you, I can do nothing. So if it's only my words, my words aren't good enough. So I pray that your spirit, Father, would meet people heart to heart and breast to breast in this place. God, I pray today that you would do something miraculous. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I am, uh, as you can tell, as you can tell, culturally, I'm black, and I come from a very loud church, um, so I'm a little animated, so if I get a little loud, I'm apologizing, not because I'm sorry, but I don't want to scare you. Um, I came, actually, my, my home church was called Abundant Life Fellowship, um, and so we were, uh, we would have been a mix between Baptist and Pentecostal, so I called us Bapticostals. Um, so whenever you came in, it was, it was almost like this. It, it, was, it was like nostalgia. I walked in the door. There's greeters. There's people that are shaking your hands and welcoming you and, and just feeling the love of Christ. And at my church, we don't have a, our own building yet. We have the same thing, but this just brought a sense of home to me. So thank you for making me feel at home. I am not a shy person. So uh, if you invited me into your home and you said, uh, help yourself, I'm going to help myself. I, especially at dinner time when people are like, oh yeah, help yourself. Listen, do you want me to help myself? Because I'm going to help myself. So I hope there's enough to go around. And today there is enough word to go around. So we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. I'll give you a second to turn there. Thank you, God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. Paul is writing a letter to the church of Corinth. Y'all good? <laughs> All right, I'm going to start. Start at verse 1. It says, Dear brothers and sisters, when I was with you, I couldn't talk to you as I would to spiritual people. I had to talk as though you belonged to this world or as though you were infants in the Christian life. I had to feed you with milk, not with solid food, because you weren't ready for anything stronger. And you still aren't ready, for you are still controlled by your sinful nature. You are jealous and, uh, of one another, and, and, and you quarrel with each other. Doesn't that prove you are controlled by your sinful nature? 
aren't you living like people of the world? When one of you says, I am a follower of Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, aren't you acting like people of the world? After all, who is Apollos and who is Paul? We are only God's servants through whom you believe the good news. Each of us did the work the Lord gave us. I planted the seed in your hearts and Apollos watered it, but it was God who made it grow. I planted the seed in your hearts and Apollos watered it, but it was God who made it grow. It is not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What is important is that God makes the seed grow. The one who plants and the one who waters works together for with the same purpose, and both will be rewarded for their own hard work. For we are both God's workers, and you are God's field. You are God's building. Uh, growing up, um, I, had a, I have a huge family. I have six sisters, two brothers. So as I uh, as before we would go out, my mother would give us a speech. I, I don't, I'm 35 years old, so we would, she would line us up for whoever was going to the store, and she would tell us, don't ask for nothing, don't touch nothing, and if you embarrass me, you can fill in the blank. My mom had a certain way of teaching us certain things behind closed doors that when we were in public, we did not act out of character, because if we acted out of character, you have, might have something come flying your way. Uh, nine times out of 10, my mom didn't have to do much, but just look at me. My, my mom had a look in her eyes, especially when we were in church, my mom had this look in her eyes. If I was, when I was younger, I would fall asleep during church. And so I would call it the assembly tap because I would sit all the way in the middle. And so these pews, how they're broken up, the pews I went to, they would, they would, they would fan out. So you would have to go all the way in. I would go in the middle on purpose because I wanted to kind of blend in, and I, you know, I stayed up the night before playing video games, and I should have been up early for church, and I wasn't. But anyways, my mom, my mom would have people tap me, and then she would look at me, and she would just, she would have this look in her eyes. And, and when she had this look in her eyes, I knew whenever church was over, I'm going to get the speech. I told you, don't act up out in public. And I'm like, all right, all right, God. All right, all right, all right, uh, Mom, I, I won't do it. So these intense and, and friendly reminders reinforced what my mom taught us behind closed doors. And being the little rubber rouser that I was, my mom was always quick to remind me whenever I got out of line to get back in line. So when we're out in public, we use filters. For my seasoned saints out there, for those that don't know what filters are, anybody got Snapchat? You got Snapchat. Ain't none of the young people gonna raise their hands. Y'all gonna leave me up here hanging by myself. I know you got Snapchat. I saw three hands here. Snapchat, right? Snapchat is it's a quick way to communicate with your friends. You can snap in a moment, you can, you can write, but you can put a filter on as well. When we're out in public, there is a certain you that I'm gonna get behind closed doors that I won't get in public. There is a certain conversation that I would get in, in behind closed doors that I wouldn't get in public, and, and that's a good thing. It's called having a little cooth, you know, the, although sometimes I wonder these days if that's still a thing. I, I, some of the conversations I hear leave me scratching my head. Some of the stuff makes me blush, and it takes a lot to embarrass me, but some of the stuff I'm like, whoa, that, that's too much. But if I could use a different word, I'd use the word lens. If we look at the definition of a lens, and the name of my message today is called the gospel lens. And if you look at the definition, a lens is an object or a device which focuses or otherwise modifies the direction of movement of light, sound, electrons, etc. cetera. Uh, so before we get into, we're going we're gonna to get to the word. I, I want to preface that there's a way we act and there's a way that we see. But sometimes, sometimes the way I acted sometimes is not always the way that I, I seen as well. Sometimes my actions didn't align with my sight. Uh, when I was between 11 and 12 years old, I remember my mom uh, took me to the eye doctors because I couldn't see far. My eyesight's not super bad, but it was bad enough that when I sat in the back of class, I really couldn't see good. And my mom was like, well, why don't you just move to the front? Well, because all the cool kids are in the back and all the uncool kids are at the front and I wanna sit in the back. So she takes me to get glasses, and I remember not being worried about the lens inside the glasses, but I wanted the cool frames. And so I would search the walls for the cool frames. And so, you know, they have the expensive wall and then the free wall. Well, I went to the expensive wall because I wanted the Ralph Lauren, I wanted the Dolce & Gabbana's, and my mom was like, no, we're gonna go to the free wall because it's not about, it's not about the frame, but it's about you being able to see. 
Uh, I feel like sometimes in life that we get caught up in the superficial of the frame, but if we're not able to see correctly, then, with, then, then the frames really mean nothing without the lens inside of it. And my mom began to give me a speech that it's your responsibility to take care of your glasses, in particular, the frames. I would fall asleep with my glasses on my face. You're going to scratch your lenses. You're not going to be able to see. And when you scratch your glasses, once it's over, it's done because insurance is not paying for a new set of glasses until next year. So that means you're gonna have to look through smudged and scratched glasses. You gotta take care of your glasses. If I could pull this to a contemporary view, because uh, to keep you guys on track with me here, is that I really feel like that we, we, we have a lens or we have a frame, so to speak, of, of this. It's called a Bible. Uh, I looked up statistics. They say that the average home has about 4.3. I don't know where the point three comes from, but there's about 4.3 Bibles in the average American home. But how often are we opening to the lens inside or are we just okay with people seeing the frame? Because see, it's not the frame that is actually producing salvation, but it's the word of God inside of the frame that is producing the word of God. It begins to change my lens. It changes the way that I view things. And it, it, I, at 35 years old, even though I have not been walking this earth that long, I can tell you that God has really changed my perspective. He changed my lens on some things in life that I thought were right, and God showed me you're actually wrong. And so if I could give you just a quick example of what lenses? Where's my lenses at? Where are my lenses at? So let's, let's say these are the gospel lenses. These are the gospel lenses. These would be my, these would be what I was born with. And you can tell from a distance that I can't see clearly, right? And this is us, this is us, with us groping through life. And, and so we point at certain things or we point at certain people and we say what is and what's not. And we, and we, we make judgment or we make prejudgments or we have our predispositions or we have our own bias or bent towards certain things. And God is like, but you can't see clearly because you don't have the gospel lens on. You still have the lens that you were born with, which is sinful lens. And until you get a gospel lens on, you're not able to see correctly. And this is the conversation that Paul starts with the, with the Corinthian church whenever he writes them the letter. He said, you are caught up in the personality of the person that actually brought you the words, but they were only a vessel for which God was using to get you the message that God wanted to get to you. You are caught up in the person in the flesh whenever you should be more wrapped up in the word that's actually coming from their mouth, which comes from God. Remember he said, he said, after all, who is Apollos and who is Paul? But they are just servants through whom you believed the good news. I cannot get so focused on who I see behind the pulpit or who's on TV that I miss the fact that it is the good news that actually changes my lens that I'm able to see correctly. There were some things that God had to switch and change in my life, and it wasn't until I put up the reflection of God's word that I was able to change my life. It wasn't comparing to my left and to my right, because see, even though we're all called to salvation, we're called to different places and spaces in life, and until I align myself with the Word of God, I'm not able to see correctly. And so then I walk around goofy with those glasses on, thinking I know something that I really don't. The Word of God tells us in Ephesians chapter 6, he says, you don't wrestle against flesh and blood but against powers and principalities and wickedness that is in high places. So the way you fight is not going to be with your attitude. The way you fight is not going to be with your hands. But I need somebody that knows how to fight with prayer. I need somebody that knows how to fight with worship. I need somebody to know how to fight with the fruit of the Spirit, with love, with peace, with kindness, with patience, with gentleness. I need somebody that knows how to fight this way because this is the kingdom of God. Don't tell me that you are filled with the Spirit of God and you lack fruit in your life. And fruit is not being able to speak in tongues. Fruit is not laying your hands on the sick and them recovering. Those are great things. Fruit is being able to respond correctly in a spirit that goes opposite to what is coming against you. We're living in a world right now where people would rather argue over a political view. Listen, it doesn't matter if you're Republican, Democrat, Independent. They're just parties. But at the end of the day, it's Jesus that has the final say. I'll tell you right now, on, on, as, far as, the, as far as the racial movement goes, I am a Christian before I was ever black. 
I can't allow, I can't allow a worldly standard to gap me from the calling that God has placed on my life. I have more issues than Time Magazine, I promise. If you follow me long enough, you will see that I have issues. I'm flawed, but I'm called. I have confidence today that there is a God that is for me, that he picked my feet from the muck and the miry clay, placed them on a solid ground, turned my life around, and then sent me out to share the word of God with other people, to let them know the same God that did it for me is the same God that is able to do it for you today. Lift your head, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Because when you walk with your head low, you can't see clearly. God is looking for some believers to lift their heads up and to see through the lens of Christ. 1 John chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4 states this, verse 20. He says, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? The body of Christ as a whole, I'm looking for believers that know how to show love to one another. And not just on Sunday, but when we're at Walmart, when we're at Shop and Save, when we're having a good day, when we're having a bad day, when things are going my way, when things are not, I am still called to love my brother. I'm called to love my sister. I'm called, to, there's a difference between covering and condoning. Now, now the word of God, right, is, is for reproof, is for correction. So some things need corrected. That, that, so, but I have to be careful because I might not be your Nathan. Remember when Nathan approaches David, he had to approach David a certain way because David's king. David could have chopped Nathan's head off. And so Nathan goes to David with a parable. Sometimes it's not what you say, it's the season of what you put on what you say. You know, you know that God has a higher calling for you? It doesn't take a prophet to see the problem. It takes a prophet to see the solution. We need a, a generation of prophetic people that will rise up and that will begin to prophesy solutions to people. Oh, no, brother. Oh, no, sister. It doesn't have to be this way because the Word of God says X, Y, and Z. Whatever solutions we need, I promise they're found in a Word. I promise if you're willing to work the Word, the Word will work for you. But you got to work it. You have to put some time and you have to put some effort and you're going to have to get up and pray and seek God and, and you're going to have to fast and turn down your plate. There's some, there are some dues, but we're not doing these things for relationship. We are working from relationship. We are saved by grace through faith when you believe. Not of works lest any man should boast. So it's not about a works, but it's about being, it's about we do these things to create a proximity of intimacy with God and then allowing God to change our hearts so that we can put off the lens of offense. We can put down the lens of judgment. We can put down the lens of, of bitterness, the lens of strife, and we can put on the gospel lens and begin to call things for what they really are. One thing dealing with kids these, in, these days in this generation, they are straight shooters. They're going to tell you how they feel, when they felt it, whether they like you or not, and you gotta come, you can't, there ain't no chasers, ain't no, and, and a lot of these kids, you gotta get it in when they're right there in your face. I'm not a shy guy, as you can tell. I'm, I'm gonna get in your face, I'm gonna tell you what's right and what's wrong according to the word of God, but I'm gonna season it in love. I'm, gonna, I'm going to pray and, and depend on the spirit of God to give me insight of where you are right now. Sometimes, sometimes they're not even ready to receive the word because they don't know that they're loved. So Jesus comes down and he loves on us. He walks among us. He spends time with the unlikely to the point where the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the teachers of religious law are like, how, how, why are you spending time with these kind of people? You should be over here with us. And God is like, because I didn't come for the people that know that they're, I didn't come for the people that are well. I come for those that know they're sick. I don't know about anybody else. I have a sin sick soul that needs a Jesus every day. This ain't no one time prayer of salvation. Some days I'm praying in the grocery store, Father, please keep my emotions subject right now. Cause if one more person looks at me wrong, I just might say something crazy. I'm that guy. I'm not, I'm not going to pull no punches with you. I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you how I feel, but that's not always fruitful, right? And so I need the Spirit of God to pull myself subject, and that's a choice, to subject myself to the Spirit of God. Why? Because I'm supposed to be showing love. How's the world going to know that Jesus loves them whenever we don't love one another? It starts in-house before it ever goes out-house. 
Second Corinthians chapter five, verses five, 15 through 16 says this, he died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them all. If Jesus had to die for me, then I have to die for others. I have to die to my flesh. I have to die to my perspective. I have to die to my emotions, my mentality my mentalities. Sometimes I can't trust my own thoughts because sometimes my thoughts aren't always aligned with the word of God. So if Jesus was raised for you. He was raised for me not to treat you like that. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. I don't see you in your humanity. I see you in your perfected form. I see you the way Jesus sees you because I have a gospel lens. I see you as healed and delivered. I see you saved. I see you operating in, the, in your godly gifts. I see you out evangelizing and sharing the gospel of Jesus. I see you opening your house and being hospitable to the stranger. I see you living your life for Christ. Because the lens of Christ, even when I don't agree with somebody's disposition on something, the lens of Christ helps me to reel it in to say, Stephen, I gave you a brand new mercy and grace every day. You don't eat leftovers. He said, new mercies I see every day. I don't, I, don't get, I don't get leftovers in the morning when I wake up. No, I get a brand new mercy and grace every day. So if you get it, that means you have to be willing to extend it as well. I have to extend the mercy and the grace that God has given me. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you, to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Pastor did not call you. Evangelist didn't call you. Your mama didn't call you. Your daddy didn't call you. God called you. He might have used their mouth, but it was God that called you. Notice when Paul starts all of his books, his epistles, he says, Paul, an apostle called by God, or by the grace of he, he affirm he lets people know, you didn't give me this position, and you can't take it away. I didn't give you your salvation. I can't take it away. It was a free gift that was given, given to you from God. And so I have to treat you the same way God would treat you, no longer considering you from a human point of view, no longer looking at your mistakes, because for every finger that I point, I could have 12 more pointing back at me. Realizing that you need the same grace and mercy that I need. I realize that the same God that called me called you, and I have to live a life worthy of that calling. You know how we live a life worthy of that calling? By loving each other. By sharing peace and joy. By uplifting one another, holding each other accountable in love and in truth. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. I have a student. I won't say his name just in case somebody knows him in here. <laughs> and this student is, is my heart. We spend a lot of time together. And this week, he did something that, that really that, that ruffled my feathers. And, and old Stephen wanted to call him and give him a whole piece of my mind. I wanted to give him all of my mind. But I understand that, I understand, even though I don't have kids, I do understand that there is a time and there is a place. I understand that sometimes certain situations provoke us to, to, to act out in our, in our sinful nature. And because he's still learning, I had to give grace in an area. He hung up on me. That's what made me mad, if I'm being honest. We were on the phone, and he hung up on me, and I got real mad. I was like, Just, uh, don't, if you don't want to talk, that's fine. But you called me, and then you hung up on me. And I wanted to call him back, and I wanted to tell him off so bad. But in that moment, I couldn't. I had to extend grace. Because I understand, I understand that my love will speak louder than what, my, than what my attitude ever would. My love would speak louder than my attitude towards him ever would. I, give, I make allowance for faults and making every effort to keep ourselves together with peace. Peace is not the absence of issues. Peace is a choice in the midst of your issues. Peace is understanding that God has all of this under control. What I don't understand, what I can't see, 
what worries me, what keeps me up at night, what bothers me. Peace is understanding that while I'm, while I'm, I'm, I'm going through this thing, whatever this is, God, you still have it in the palm of your hand. And today, I believe that God sent me over here as I was praying this week, uh, I've been praying since actually Mr. Mr. Poger reached out to me, but this particular week when I was really laboring over the word, and I was like, God, I, I don't know these people. I don't, I, don't know what's, what, I don't know the ins, outs, ups, downs. I don't know anything. All I know is that you have a word for them. And I believe that God wants to restore hearts today. God told, God, I, while I was praying, God said, I want to restore broken hearts now, I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure of, of all of your theology. I went online and I, I read all the I read all of your stuff <laughs> to make sure that I don't want to I don't I don't want to to scare or offend anybody. But I need you to understand that there is a God who speaks, and when He speaks, when He spoke at the beginning, nothing responded and became something. So when He speaks to your broken heart, your heart has to mend, if you allow it. Sometimes we hold back from God for whatever reason. There's, a, there's many reasons why we hold back, but God today wants to break silence. I want to break the silence and, and, and confess what it is that's been bothering you and let me heal your heart. See, you've been, you've been working it out up here. It's not up here, it's here that's the problem. I, I, want, to, I want to work this up because if I can get this right, I can get this right. Your heart, he said, he said, from out of the abundance of the mouth, the heart speaks. And sometimes we're speaking out of hurt. Sometimes we're speaking out of guilt, hurt, shame, and God, hurt, guilt, hurt, shame, and defeat. And God wants to heal you of those places. There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. If you are in Christ, Christ is in you. And he wants to heal your broken heart. He wants to heal your broken heart so that you're able to put on the gospel lens and see things for how they really are. Because what you thought was hopeless is not. What you thought couldn't be fixed, it's fixable. I serve a God today that I know is real. There was an old hymn that I used to sing growing up. Real, real, Jesus is real to me. Oh, gave me the victory so many people doubt him but i can't live without him that is why i love him so jesus is real to me because i know that he's real to me it means he can work out he can work out anything that i'm going through so as I close today, as I close today, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and open your hearts. Today, whatever it is that you're dealing with, it could be your, your, your own personal sanctuary. Growing up, we used to do altar calls. Or we would have people come forward and raise their hands or, or whatever the case is. Today, make your seat your sanctuary. And as you are sitting and you are considering what it is that you have been dealing with in your broken heart, and this, this word is not just for, this word is not just for people that have been walking with God for a long time. I'm speaking to teenagers in here. Things that, things that even your parents have maybe forbidden you to do, and you're like, I don't understand what the big deal is. Like, why is it such a problem for me to watch this? Why is it such a problem for me to listen to this? Like, why is it? And, and, you, and you're missing the fact that they're actually, they're not prohibiting you, they're protecting you. God is not looking to prohibit you. He's looking to protect you. That's why there's rule and regulation set in place to protect us. And sometimes we look at, at God's protection as a prohibit. And God is like, I want to switch your perspective today. I'm not prohibiting you. I'm protecting you. Because if you go do that thing or if you stay here too long, it's going to affect your heart. Bitterness is going to set in. Anger is going to set in. And from your mouth is going to spew these things. God today wants to heal those broken places. For the person in here that is questioning God, that is angry at God, there are certain individuals in here that are angry with God, and God is like, I'm not afraid of your anger. Lay it at the altar. Bring it to me. You have convinced yourself that I can't handle your emotions. Yes, I can. If I took the sin of the world through my son on his back, I can handle your anger. I can handle your bitterness. I can handle your questions of why, but you got to bring it to me. But God, you're supposed to know everything. Yeah, you're right, I do know it all. But until you willingly lay it down, I can't do anything for you. You gotta lay it down.
the caveat to free will. I gave you free will. And I'm asking you to freely lay it down. You've been looking for rest in all the wrong places. He said, come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Rest is found in Jesus. So today, God, I pray over every brother and sister in this place. I pray, Father, that the Spirit of God would flood their hearts and illuminate, God, the areas that they need to get right, including my life. This ain't just for them. This word is for me, too, because I got stuff to get right in my heart. I don't stand up here perfect. I just stand up here as a vessel. God, I pray today that they would dare to trust you again. They would dare to be in close proximity again. They would dare to love you again. They would dare to call on your name with, with, with some anger and with some bitterness and say, God, I'm angry, I'm mad, and I don't understand, but yet I still come. Today, God, I pray that as they live in that honest place with you, that you would begin to break every fetter and chain that has been holding them back from destiny that has been holding them back from living the abundant life that you have called them to live. God did not say that I come that you would have church. He said, I came that you would have life and life abundantly. If the only abundant life that you are experiencing is on a Sunday, there is a problem. God wants you to experience abundant life Monday through Sunday, every day of the week. And abundant life is not always what's attached to your bank account. It's not always what is in your house, but it's what's in your heart. So set free today the captives, Father, including myself. Reveal yourself in a mighty way, and I pray that as they progress through this week, God, that you would continue to speak words of love and affirmation and remind each person in here that you are for them and not against them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.